first thing, um, well, the first, so the first thing on our agenda is uh, this mask uh, mandate discussion, but I actually um, want to flip that around with item four, the discussion regarding proposed uh, council resolution condemning racism and police brutality. Um, so if there's no objection to that, I'd love to do that first. And um, any, any objection to that? No. Nope. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to turn that over to Lauren um, to talk about. Uh, yeah, and so I had been working on a resolution, you know, as the name um, states, condemning uh, police brutality and racism. Um, and, you know, I know this is an issue top of mind for our community, um, really important and really, you know, hope that as a city council, we can make a statement on this. Um, I ended up, I was trying to pull it together quickly and uh, was getting some input from some um, important stakeholders and ended up not having enough time to incorporate and try to get the language right so that it really kind of reflects what I hope to put forward to you all to consider. Um, so I'm hoping we can consider that next week um, and apologies for the kind of coming in last minute, but would you know rather get it right than try to rush it um, knowing it's a really important um, statement that I hope we can make together. So. That's the, the short update, but, and that will give more time for you all to kind of look at it and consider it than trying to rush it, rush it out to you. And you're muted. Sorry, uh, thank you for working on that. Uh, Dan. Yeah, I, just a quick question as to, you know, is this a resolution that would, you know, obviously uh, condemn these racism and, and brutality, um, but is there any type of action that's attached to it? Um, uh, the, the action that it's speaking to is our, is effectively affirming our commitment to, you know, continuously be working as a community to um, ensure that, you know, our city and working with our police department to make sure we're implementing you know, the best possible practices um, and, and that we're kind of convening community conversations on this topic as we've um, previously kind of enshrined in our social and economic justice advisory committee. Um, so that's, that's, but that, those are the pieces that I'm working to make sure that I can really refine and make sure they are the, the, the right next steps um, or the right kind of what we're resolving to do from here. Hey, and along those lines, um, I received a, a call, I mean, an email from a constituent asking, you know, if there was any sort of formal committee that has ever uh, to give sort of a channel of feedback to the police, not saying that necessarily we have a problem here, but, um, you know, and it, it just made me realize and maybe Bill, you know, the answer to this, it, has there ever been any type of sort of formal conduit to the police as a citizen advisory panel or um, something something similar because I, it, it strikes me that you know it, it's one thing for this resolution to condemn and um, but it raises an interesting question of you know how, how do we as citizens give feedback um, to the police? I can tell you that every time you know it, it's occasionally come up, not actually that often. And um, when it has, the city council has actually said pretty much uh, repeatedly, we feel that we're the elected representatives and we have a pretty good connection with the police department. We can see them whenever we want. We hire a manager to oversee them. And that is the avenue for people to have direct control. We're not so big that, that the police is, is out of our sight. Um, and that said, groups like the Community Justice Center have interactions with them, the Social Economic Justice Committee uh, have interactions or offer suggestions and, and look at things. You know, various groups have come up over the years to talk about specific um, issues, uh, committees, but um, typically whenever any kind of police advisory or oversight or whatever committees come up, at least in the past, council has said, we got this. So, and, you know, I guess my own opinion is it's worked really well. We haven't had any, you know, we've got an excellent police department. Uh, we don't have a lot of cause for concern. We, we push for high standards. They've delivered high standards. And um, I think the council's been a great reflection of the community for the police department. Right. Any other comments on this particular 
topic. Okay, um, I also, uh, sorry, I feel like I heard someone there. Yeah, uh, I want to speak on this. This is Steve Whitaker. Oh, hi. Go ahead, Steve. So I, I want to take, uh, I want to differ with Bill that we don't have problems here. Uh, I, I want to remind you that when, after Mark Johnson was shot, we agreed to have a, another session where the public, there's many concerned people who talk to me regularly that we're not given an opportunity to speak about the impact that has had on our community. And instead it was brushed under the rug at seven, seventh on the menu of the next meeting and considered finished. And I recently wrote uh, city councilors and I believe I copied the city manager of one of the homeless guys who his, his unopened beers were stolen and he can't make, it, make any sense out of you know, why he could go get arrested for stealing unopened beers from the store, but the cops can steal his unopened beers. And we do have problems, and we do need an oversight committee with teeth. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Mayor, if you're taking public comment on this, we have two folks raising their hands currently, um, an Aaron O, and then someone who's calling themselves all things LGBTQ. Great, yes. Um, let's uh, go with Aaron first. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Um, so I was curious if there are scheduled trainings, education, et cetera, um, for emergency response teams in general, not just the police department, but all teams. Um, and are they open for the public to review and to provide feedback to? That's my question. That's a great question. And Aaron, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, would you mind also just uh, telling us where you live? Sure, I live on Barry Street. Awesome. Um, and John, do you need anything else for the record there? I'm going to go with no. It would be, I'm sorry, it would be great to have your, your full name so I'm not just putting Aaron O. Even sure. Uh, it's Aaron, last name is O'Connell. O-C-O-N-N-E-L-L, -L. yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so I would say we have a whole lot of trainings that a, a lot of departments participate in, um, fire, police, some of them are you know, physical training, some of them are situation training. Uh, the police do anything from, uh, they certainly do implicit bias training, they do uh, mental health training. They do, uh, in fact, they were the first department in the state to be fully certified in, I want to call it the team two training. There's a, a different name for it. Um, they do tactical training. They do, you know, emergency response training. They do interactions. So all sorts of training. The chief usually reviews those with the council during budget time or at, at other times uh, to go over. We'd be happy to go through and provide a list of what types of training are. It's pretty ongoing. I think the same with the fire department uh, and DPW. You know, we have all sorts of things. As, as a city, we uh, specifically to speak to this point, we try to do annually uh, implicit bias and those types of training for all of the folks that that uh, that interact with the public in any way. Um, and obviously, we just announced a new police chief today, so he will probably bring his own training regimen in you know, reflecting those priorities. We don't know what that will be yet. Okay, um, thank you. And um, uh, all things LGBTQ. Yes, first of all, I'd like to identify myself. My name is Ann Charles and my Zoom account is um, under the name of a cable access show we have. But I'm not calling from all things LGBTQ. I'm calling as a private citizen. And uh, my second point is I had originally planned to just listen to the mask discussion. But since this has come up, I um, and I don't want to be confrontational, but I was a little concerned by Mr. Frazier's hat answer, everything is fine. Um, the other caller, member of the public, mentioned that shooting in the round table in the roundabout in Montpelier that many citizens found very disturbing 
And, you know, as a citizen who's been following, I've lived here 12 years in Montpelier, you know, I, when that young man was shot in the high school, that he was shot 14 times. I mean, a lot of these things raise concerns and the public has them, but I, you know, so I was disturbed by Mr. Frazier saying, everything's fine, it's all good, we're perfect. We've got training, we've got everything in place because I would argue that everything isn't necessarily in place. That's all. Yeah, I'm, I'd like to apologize if, if, if I said that. I, I didn't mean to say it quite that way, that everything was fine. What I meant to say, what, what I was trying to say was the interactions between the police and the public and the um, council have been working fine. Obviously, there are things of great concern. Um, the, the mayor did hold a forum, despite what you heard earlier, um, inviting people to come to talk about that, and very few people participated. Um, and obviously when, when the findings were released, we did a full press release live, uh, broadcast it live with the state's attorney. We released all the videos. Um, these are very disturbing things. Nobody wants to be involved in these things. I can understand why anybody would be, um, be you know, understood about that. Uh, I do think when, when you said someone was shot 14 times, uh, first of all, I'm not sure that's correct. And second of all, uh, that implies 14 separate shootings when you know there were a lot of people and the folks that did fire all fired at the same time it wasn't uh, not to make light of it but uh, that it implies repeated action it was it was very spontaneous the person lifted a gun at a police officer and those on site responded uh, and again as much videos could be released from that and information from that could be was presented so i appreciate the concern we take this all very seriously and try to release as much as we can as publicly as we can at all times. And if I may just say one more response. Um, I think there is, um, I wouldn't say widespread, but there is active distrust of the police in Montpelier and in Vermont. Um, and so I just like to um, present a counter narrative, although, you know, I'm not an expert on these things either. Thank you. I think there's always some distrust of police everywhere. Um, and it's something we try to work all the time to break down. And I, I you probably didn't hear the new chief today talk about that's his top priorities to reach out to the community and build as much trust as possible. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, um, Anne. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a another another person has raised uh, their hands. But um, <laughs> um, go ahead uh, and you uh, go ahead to uh, unmute yourself. Um, I'm the person that wrote the letters this morning to most of the council members and to you, the mayor. And I did write a letter to the current police chief, although I had heard about the new police chief and. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I've lived in Montpelier for a number of years now, and I call it home, and I love Montpelier. Um, <laughs> it's my favorite city in the world, um, <laughs> and I spend a lot of time in Philly and New York City and Boston, and um, that's where we go for fun and museums, but um, I did write a letter about citizen, um, a citizen oversight committee because, well, I feel very safe in this town most of the time. And I feel like everything that's happening in the world, we do a great job at a lot of things. And I think like to sort of intercept this at a time where, where it's advantageous because we have a new police chief coming in that we could really like I love reading the police log because it's like we close down the tourism shack and we walk these people to the bank and I'm just like, oh, that's so cute. Um, and that's always the wonderful thing about Montpelier is that there's community policing and I've never had a run in. I've had a run ins with police in other places, but never here. And um, as a person of color, I'm always like, 
on edge about things, but Montpelier is my home. I grew up in Marshfield. I lived in Montreal. I came back here um, because I couldn't quite move back to Marshfield, but I love Montpelier and it is my home. And I'm just like, this is a place that is wonderful and we can make it better. And I'm hoping like, I think about like how we can make it better before it gets worse and how we can be a shining example because my daughter lives here and I want her to be like, I want to live in Montpelier when I grow up. Um, we have so many friends here and it's a great place and I just want to keep it a great place. And that's why I wrote you guys. And that's why I really, really hope that we can do something. I know there's been efforts in the past. I know there's been people involved that are sort of like, Ugh. but the urgency is here and who, the people that want to participate on their own level where they say we have to address white supremacy, we have to do this, we have to do that. I mean, even if it's just simple questions, it doesn't have to be a statcom meeting. It doesn't have to be mor morbidity and mentality. It, it can be just a community meeting where we're like, hey, we love the fact you closed down the tourism thing. And hey, like, you know, when I see the police, I'm not afraid. I like love walking down the street. I don't have any fears about walking down the street here, whereas in other places I do. And I think that like that community feeling is what makes this a great town. But I also feel like I would like to see more people of color in this town and say that it's a great place. And um, I know my friend Kaya, she was a legislator here and uh, she works here every now and again. And I'm like, you can come stay at my house and bring your kid and my daughter will babysit for you. Um, and that's what I want, like everybody to feel welcome here. And if we have a history of doing the right thing, then that's what's important. Not just like we tried this, we couldn't do it. Um, we don't need to do it because it's addressed. We just do it because we meet as community members and we talk about things and it's like the old town meetings where like people talk to me about Vermont town meetings like that's where we meet each other face to face and there's no like amount of work that I won't put in and hours I won't put in but this is really important because I think this town deserves it and I think it's important because this is our capital city and we do lots of great things like not letting McDonald's in so um, we can do more great things and I really believe in this thank you I'm done great. thank you I'll just add that I don't think I think we would be delighted and I'm certain that uh, both the present chief and the new chief would be happy to have community forums and group meetings. Um, I think that's a great suggestion and set those up on a regular basis. I think it's a wonderful idea. You know, I, if, if this was uh, during normal time, I feel like something that could, that would be really neat um, would be even just like an introductory meeting, like to, to say, um, hey, Montpelier, uh, here's our, our new police chief come and and meet our new chief and ask him um, all the questions you have almost as like an initial um, meeting as to like what you're suggesting that's not exactly the same as an oversight board but um, it's an interesting it, it could be a first step towards that um, anyway I I'm open I'm open to that and and let's uh, let's talk more about it great thanks so much Oh, and um, John, do you um, actually, so um, uh, Anne or Anne, I, I just, uh, I'm, it would be great if we knew your full name and where you live. Oh, you're still muted. My full name is Anne Ducharme. And I live um, on Berry Street, 191 Berry Street, 202. <laughs> and and uh, um, uh, Anne, Charles, uh, just, I, I know, I think I know where you live, but um, if you could tell, uh, just for the record, where you're at. Absolutely, 58 Berry Street, apartment 302. Goodness, Berry Street representing today. Yes, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> 
also also Bear Street right here. Anyway. Um, okay, cool. Anyone else? Okay. Um, thank you all. Thanks for your um, thoughtful comments. And I hope this is the beginning of the discussion and not the end of it. So let's let's keep talking. Um, okay. Um, so we're gonna move on to the uh, mask discussion, the mask mandate. Um, so there have been, well, so there was a, a draft that was attached and I know there's a couple of different uh, uh, edits that have been floating around. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to either Bill or Cameron uh, to uh, introduce and we'll go from there. I'll do, I'll do a quick intro then slide it to Cameron. After your last meeting uh, we did research the issue of a health order and um, were basically told by the health department they did not think that was an appropriate use of a health order and that they wanted to keep the health orders consistent around the state uh, and so they urged us to do this under the authority of the governor's executive order, which is what we've cited, which uh, also um, expressly granted the authority to cities and towns. Um, that's as far as we can tell is what um, the other communities that have enacted these have used as their authority. And Cameron did the drafting uh, based primarily on Brattleboro. I think when we had last meeting when we talked about this, people liked their approach. So we use that as our primary basis but I'll turn that over to her for the details. Yes, so um, in the order, we did make sure to cite your uh, legislative power to do this um, and the uh, instructions from the governor to, that he wants uh, legislative bodies of each municipality to enact these. Um, also based on your feedback from last week, we added a more robust exceptions section and made sure that um, that language was consistent with what the state's guidance is. Um, so that does include an age limit. Um, the state recommended and the health department recommended anyone under the age of two to not wear a mask. So that was very clear. And that if somebody uh, does have a medical condition that prevents them from wearing a facial covering, they should not be held um, uh, to the standard of wearing one if they have a disability or um, are differently abled and cannot wear a mask. Um, we also um, had the posting requirements I know that there was some feedback on the verbiage there, so we'll talk about that. Um, I do want to make a note about the effective period because of right now, the state of emergency in Vermont is set to be lifted June 15th, unless the governor extends it. But right now, this would go through um, either y'all amending, rescinding, or suspending this order if you do enact it, or until the state of emergency um, is ended the way it's written. So, um, because that is the thing that gives the power to your body to enact this sort of measure. So um, right now that's the 15th, but that could change. Okay. Um, and I just want to clarify there's on this draft, uh, the, the, on the draft that uh, has been posted, there were a um, uh, couple of edits that people, well, that, that came up. One was um, just removing the uh, reference to airports. Uh, and then the other was adding some specificity to um, other locations to uh, post signs. Um, so that's in, in the, uh, cue for for amendments. Um, before we get too too deep in, um, Dan, do you want to add anything about or you know say anything about this? Sure, uh, Dan Grover, executive director of Montpelier Alive and resident on Liberty Street. Um, I first of all, I want to express gratitude to the city council for considering this. Um, I, representing uh, more than 65 businesses downtown who have already pledged to require a mask of their customers. Um, it's an important step for uh, the health and safety of our community. So thank you so much. Um, I, I also wanna express gratitude for your thoughtfulness in considering the um, exceptions for people with health issues. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion of that on, on our Facebook page, certainly as we uh, discussed that city council was considering this. So, 
So thank you for including that. Um, the only thing I would add, and I, I emailed the mayor and a uh, bill about this this morning is um, some concern about uh, face shields being um, allowed in place of a, a face mask or, or co covering. Um, as of the last we heard from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, face shields are not an acceptable um, substitution for face masks, except if there's an underlying health condition that prevents the, um, the mask from being worn. Um, and there was some concern among businesses that if there was an alternative presented, that then this whole sort of unified front that we're trying to present by having a city ordinance um, might get uh, impacted by having some some uh, businesses that were interested in allowing the shields and others that weren't. So um, I, I'm encouraging the council to uh, remove the masks or perhaps to um, move that into the section about exceptions um, and maybe say that that could be an acceptable alternative if there's an underlying health condition that prevents the use of a, a mask. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, Jack. Thank you. Uh, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you. I, I emailed the council a proposal of an amendment. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly how to manage this, given that we were not going to be here in person. So I thought this would be an easy way to get it in front of uh, people. Um, and I, I would share share the screen, share this document to the screen, except I don't know how to do it. But uh, the uh, what part of my takeaway from a meeting we had last week was that because uh, you know, we talked about the fact that right now businesses have the authority to refuse entry to anyone that doesn't wear a mask if they uh, choose to do that. And I had the sense that uh, businesses didn't want to be the heavies, didn't want to be the one that were, was telling people you can't come in if you uh, don't wear a mask and but when the, the way the la language is drafted it uh, it does it still puts that burden on the business of requiring customers staff and visitors to wear a mask so my proposed amendment uh, the highlighted language would be to require be, be basically saying as a matter of this city ordinance, the city itself is telling people you are required to wear a mask when you enter um, an establishment located in the city of Montpelier. And so the proposal, and I move to uh, make this amendment to add the language after the word 2020, any person, whether an employee, a customer, or a visitor, visitor who enters and then deletes the word all, adds the word and, deletes the S from establishments, and then continuing on, shall deleting require both staff and customers or visitors to. So just read that any person, whether an employee, a customer, or a visitor who enters an establishment located in the city of Montpelier shall wear face coverings or face shields over their nose and mouth while inside the establishment. And then it just makes clear that this is a general requirement imposed by the city on everyone entering a business in the city. I have a question on that. It's, mm -hmm. it's all right, Mayor. Um, I just want to um, address what Dan just said um, about moving the face shields to the exceptions section, stating it like if anyone has a medical condition that is complicated by facial coverings like a cloth mask, a face shield is an appropriate alternative. It may be taking it out of that section. I, I agree with that idea, yeah. Uh, Connor and then Dan. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll second the motions with uh, Cameron's suggested edit there. Um, and just say, I, you know, I, I think when we do this, we don't do it lightly. I spoke to a couple of business owners today who, you know, it, it's very real for them as they're started back up. Um, they've been through the mill already with the coronavirus and just the thought of, you know, this may be preventing them from having a couple of customers. 
uh, is very anxiety inducing to them. But you know, government, government like in municipal government, uh, including really is operating at the apex of its power during the coronavirus. And I think every meeting we go to, there are things we try to decide that might be outside our comfort level a bit. Um, I still think this should have been a state initiative, but it's not. Um, and when you, you talk to workers, when it comes back, I, I think it is a workers issue. We spoke about this last time. I, I spoke to a couple of retail workers who said, you know, um, my boss isn't requiring this. And every day when I go to work, I, I go to work with a pit in my stomach um, because I can see people going in and out. And I, I don't want this to happen to my family and myself. I, I, I see this as a way just like OSHA, anything, just kind of leveling the playing field for businesses in Montpelier to make sure employees don't have that anxiety when they go to work each day. Um, and I think it does relieve business owners a bit. So, you know, it's not something we like to do as city council, but I think it's important that we do it. And uh, so again, I second Jack's motion here. Um, so Connor, I just want to be clear. Um, so you're, uh, and Jack, uh, so your motion is about, um, I understand Jack's motion to be about um, the, uh, you know, portion about all employees and removing the, the bit later about require both staff and customers um, or visitors too. Um, and then all is it also including um, uh, Dan's suggestion about moving the section about face shields? My motion doesn't include that we would need to add language. I, I would suggest we, uh, we deal with my motion then add language to, uh, to do uh, that other suggestion. Okay, and just want to flag also the thing about um, airports, not that it's a big deal. Um, I saw Dan and then Donna. Well, I, I, it may make sense to uh, go forward with Jack's motion. I have additional change, uh, or at least a question about the term establishment. Um, I didn't see any definition of it and the problem that I have is that establishment under the, the dictionary includes both public businesses as well as uh, places of residence. Um, and I don't think we intend to include that. Um, and I also don't think we intend to include, um, you know, any, any place of business where the public doesn't necessarily enter. Um, this is really for public entrances, you know, places where the, the workers or customers or people are being in a general flow. So, um, you know, either I, I, I think it might make sense to, to just define establishment for um, to be a place of um, uh, a place of business where the public regularly enters and exits. Um, in that way, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't accidentally include residences, and it doesn't accidentally include um, you know businesses where there is no public visitor, the sort of sole office kind of place. Um, okay, your point is well taken. Um, I, I'm hoping to keep yeah. it just because there is a motion on this. Maybe we right, and I, I'm willing to. Yeah. That's why I say I'm I'm willing to. Sorry, I, I went a little yeah, too far. Okay. No um, I would like to um, sort of read the statement aloud again, sort of with tax um, amendment so that we can get the understanding. Because I, I think the way it's written um, underlines what Dan is talking about. So I just want to read it out loud one more time and sort of get the uh, understanding of what the motion is, if that's okay, Mayor. That is Mayor, okay. Mayor, are you going to take public comment on this? We will, but um, I think Donna is actually next. Let's hear from Donna, and then um, we'll have a, a reading um, of um, the, the statement, and then we'll see if there's uh, further discussion. Um, but we will take com uh, comment on even just this amendment. So uh, Donna, go ahead. Do you want me to go before Cameron or after her? No, you go before. Is it, it okay. it's on this topic? I mean, I do agree with Cameron that the whole statement makes it very clear that it's not a private resident. And you could add the word public in front of establishment. I, I, I would hope that Jack would be willing, maybe either we have a lot of motions or we could add public in front of establishment, take out face shields and accept 
his proposal. Would you be open to that, Jack? Or do we need to make several motions? Oh, sure, that's fine with me. All good too. So that it would read who enters a public establishment and it just further defines what is later said, an establishment purpose of receiving services, purchasing products or otherwise conducting business shall wear face coverings over their nose and mouth while inside the establishment. Is that clear, John? John Odom? Uh oh. Yes. I'll have, the, I'll have the language for him as well. Yeah, okay. and I can. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so Jack and Connor were feeling clear about that language then. Okay. Yes. And okay. So, um, any other comments from the council on this particular amendment? And then we'll go to comments from the public. Okay. Um, any comments from the public on this? Somebody muted me just after I asked that last question. So uh, now I had to unmute myself this time. Uh, this is Steve Whitaker for the record. Uh, the reference to proposed amendments to the amendments, all of which have not been seen and can't be seen by someone over a telephone, uh, tell me that this is this like the uh, other proposal that Lauren Hurl uh, has offered should be postponed to a a uh, subsequent meeting and put forth properly on paper ahead of time. Uh, I also want to point out the absurdity or the hypocrisy of when you've been made aware that people are crapping in the streets for lack of public bathrooms and you're not worried about health, that health problem um, is, is kind of absurd that we're going to use this. I, I don't mind being told I can't go into Book Spieler without a mask on. And I went and found a mask and went back, same with Olivita. I think the merchants can handle this at their own discretion to kind of be the big brother and say, we're going to absolve you of the need to be the heavy is, is really patently absurd when you got bigger problems on your plate, like lack of public restrooms and a lot of people uh, 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 making real public health hazards out of that, uh, which is contagious. So. I think I would ask that you consider properly presenting this in full written form uh, and, and dealing with it at a subsequent. It may be moved in two weeks anyway, so you're really going through the motions, you know, uh, and deal with some of the bigger problems. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Stephen. Um, any further comment from the public? We have two hands raised, um, Dan Groberg and Ann Charles. Okay, let's um, let's go with uh, Ann Charles first, and then we'll go to Dan, if that's all right. Um, go ahead, Ann. Thank you. Um, I became um, concerned about this for several reasons that I think are obvious to most of the members of this committee. I tuned. I couldn't come last week, but I listened to most of your session, and it seemed like we were all on the same page. The, re the reason I was originally concerned is that there's so much backlash on Front Porch Forum and elsewhere in the public to a modest measure of, require of re requiring customers to wear masks that I'm really appalled. And I agree with all of the speakers. I can remember Connor and, um, one other person who spoke with merchants uh, in rural areas, you know, outside of Montpelier, who said that they, it's unfair to put the burden on them. And I think of um, I think of several merchants who are my friends. Who um, I mean, we hear around the country of violence against people trying to enforce this very modest measure. So, and, you know, and Dan Groberg, I didn't realize about his initiative. Um, of, you know, what is it, 84 businesses signed on to it. I learned about it last time. I'd like to applaud that. And I'd like to applaud all your efforts. And I hope cooler heads are prevailing in this body, and they seem to be. So that's all I have to say, really. 
Thank you, Ann. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I realized while we're <laughs> while we're already amending things um, that as uh, as I understand the order as written, um, there are not any exceptions for um, businesses in which it would be impossible to wear a mask while, uh, <laughs> like for instance, I can think of um, in, uh, indoor dining, which is going to be allowed shortly. Um, I can also think of um, uh, close contact businesses like um, uh, hairstylists are currently allowed to do like beard trims or things like that that might require you to remove a mask. Um, and I'm not sure that that's addressed in this order. So do you have any suggestions regarding that or that we just revisit it once the rules have changed? I mean, I think it, there are businesses that it would impact already. Okay. So I would yeah. uh, be concerned about revisiting it subsequently. Um, I wonder if there's some way to put it in the exceptions, like, um, so long. It's, hard, it's hard to say like where state guidance has accepted it because state guidance is not requiring it to begin with, but, um, perhaps there's some way to say like in specific circumstances where state guidance, um, allow, allows, I don't, I don't really know. I, there are, there are brighter minds who are in charge of writing these things on the call. <laughs> So there is a, an exceptions um, section. Perhaps we can um, call out some businesses that we know will, like it doesn't make sense for them to do business while wearing masks. Um, but let's, let's revisit that. Um, so, cause right now we have a motion and it's been seconded uh, on some specific language changes. Um, any further discussion about that? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. And opposed. Okay, did not see anyone there. So uh, the motion carries. Uh, so we've changed it uh, a, a bit. Um, I wanna come back to, uh, uh, actually, Lauren, did you have something you wanted to add? I feel like you've been kind of raising your hand. Yeah, no, I just had no. two really fair things, which apologies for not getting the chance to email. Um, one is is just um, at the top of page two, it says, in accordance the state of Vermont executive term. I think it's supposed to be in accordance with the state of Vermont. So just make sure that reads okay. And then we've got, so people can see where that is. And then we have on the paragraph right above that, the very bottom of page one, it says starting June 3rd, all establishments. I'm wondering if we like pass this now, if there's businesses open this evening, I don't know if there are, but like, should we do it tomorrow at least? So people could get the word out um, or is there some kind of notice to our businesses, especially since we're gonna, they're gonna have to figure out signage and that kind of stuff. Just a little bit of um, cushion there might be good. Would you suggest tomorrow, Friday, Monday, Saturday? Um, I don't know if Dan Groberg might have thoughts if people feel like it immediately is, is good so people can just start referring to us if, if um, you know, so maybe even as soon as tomorrow and we can post it tonight up publicly and stuff and Dan can send message to the members. And I don't want to delay this because it seems like it's helpful to the businesses um, from what we're hearing. Um, I just more, it seems like until we can put the word out, it's hard to, <laughs> to say. Uh, you, I could suggest a compromise in which the signage is not required until Monday perhaps, but the ordinance goes into effect tomorrow. That makes sense to me. Sorry, so you're saying the signage isn't required until perhaps Monday? Correct. Okay. Um, Lauren, are you making a motion to make these changes? I can, unless, I don't know if anyone else has any other simple ones that could be lumped or if it's easier to just. Um, can we also include in that uh, the removal of, uh, or airports? Airports, yes. Airports, yes. <laughs> um, and then there is one other line that I would like to um, potentially include and 
Um, it's going to take me a second to get there. Um, but uh, I want to come back to, to Dan. You had made a comment earlier about um, public establishments uh, or establishments in general. How are you feeling about that um, with the modifications we've made so far? Um, well, actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with the public establishments and the con and read within the context of that. I, I think that helps to clarify. Um, it's just the establishment, the, because the establishment word was repeated several times throughout, I think adding that public is satisfies that. Uh, I think my other concern, you know, dovetails a little bit with Dan Broberg's concern which is that I don't think we want this mask requirement to apply where it would it would either be thwart it would thwart the activity such as a restaurant or um, where it would serve no public purpose such as a single occupant office where there isn't a flow of, of traffic. Um, as I sit here in, in my office alone, um, I wonder if this ordinance would require me to wear a mask in those circumstances. And I think it's just something that I want to make, be satisfied that either we have an exception or the language can be read um, not to apply in such a, such a case. So let's revisit the exceptions part um, in a minute. I feel like we're kind of in like perfunctory sort of, right. uh, or you know, easiest changes right now. Um, That's not a problem. Yeah, cool. Um, there, so there's one other line that I think is probably not that controversial, um, uh, which is under uh, the posting of requirements, that um, paragraph, just to add a sentence at the end that said other locations can be alternative entrances, parentheses, back doors, comma, et cetera, or at transaction locations such as registers, parentheses. So it's just trying to give a little a little specificity to what um, other locations might be appropriate. Um, any other sort of perfunctory stuff, uh, Jack? On that posting uh, requirement, I just went back and looked at it as you were talking about it. It might be better instead of saying each individual each establishment is individually responsible. It might be better to just say shall each individual, each establishment shall post signage. That makes sense to me. Um, so as, as we're uh, keeping track here, we have um, <laughs> in accordance uh, with the state of Vermont, removal of airports, um, the line about other locations, uh, changing uh, the posting requirement to uh, shell, and then also an effective date um, of, what did we say, for Monday um, for the posting requirement. I think that's five changes. Is, is there anything else that's relatively perfunctory here? Uh, Donna. Well, I just wondered if in the exceptions, could you put except while eating? Well, let's let's deal with the exceptions okay. in a minute because I think that's gonna be okay. a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, um, go ahead, Dan. Uh, a suggestion to, oh, sorry. I don't know which Dan you were talking about, but <laughs> I was gonna suggest language to help the, the other Dan. So um, adding the language while in the presence of others, um, that's language that's appeared in other state um, statute. Uh, the other piece is like, I'm thinking about my, you know, people, employees who are in their stores by themselves. Um, you know, maybe they want to break from their mask between customers because um, they're annoying to wear, or um, you know, you know, maybe they're not actually open. They're just preparing orders or doing other things. Do they need to be wearing a mask? So perhaps while in the presence of others, could be language like that. Um, where where would we? I think we're still going to need to revisit the exceptions part probably because of salons, but. Um, where, um... um, so it could be, um, sorry, I have so many windows open, um, while inside the establishment and in the presence of others. Which paragraph is that under? Uh, that's, um, requirement to wear. paragraph under requirement to wear face covering. Okay, great. Okay. 
So is there a motion regarding these changes? I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay, any further discussion about these changes? Are we, do I need to list them again? Or are we feeling pretty clear? As, as long as we're including the dam suggestion, which I think does hit exactly on the nail head, the um, concern that I had. Okay. Um, while in the presence of others, and then these uh, uh, minor edits as well as what I understand my motion to include. Yep, great. Okay, any further discussion on this? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, um, uh, Dan, uh, uh, I saw Dan first and then Jack. Okay, I, I, I have, I, I've taken a stab at, at possible language to, to, to uh, Dan's concern, um, which is we could, if, if you're ready to talk about exceptions. Yes, um, yes, that would be the time. So I would suggest this sentence in the exceptions just at the end of the current exception saying, this ordinance shall not strictly apply if it would frustrate the primary purpose of the business, such as a restaurant or salon. Can you please repeat that for me? I'm, I'm keeping track sure. of it's for John. This ordinance shall not strictly apply if it would frustrate the primary purpose of the business, such as a restaurant or salon. Cool. Um, Jack, then Lauren. It's exactly where I was going. I have a slightly different formulation. So one of, we can decide which one of them we like better. And mine would go on the same uh, space at the end of exceptions. And it would say, masks will not be required for health care, health and beauty, close contact, food service, or other business establishments in which the nature of the service provided is incompatible with the wearing of the mask. I think you want to be careful about food service because during the preparation of food and that kind of stuff. Good point. Um, okay, so Lauren and then Donna. Um, yeah, I guess hearing those two iterations, I mean, I might be more inclined towards Dan not getting into naming because I mean I'm thinking Jax would cover some of this but you know you can start thinking of you know dentistry I don't know if gyms open things like that where wearing a mask might be difficult so I like the you know would frustrate the primary purpose of it or however it was exactly worded I might not say salons as one of the examples maybe something else because I think if you're getting a haircut you could sure. wear a mask, but some services like a beard trim, you couldn't. So I would rather not fully exempt salons, um, yeah. use that as an example that would be um, accepted. I think we could come up with another, you know, kind of business that the nature is more clearly always um, like dentistry. <laughs> sure, and, and, and I'm happy to even remove the examples because, you know, that just may be the cleanest way and just leave the language fr frustrate the primary purpose um, of the business. Okay, uh, Donna. Uh, Dan, my question for that example is, when you go into a restaurant, I would still expect people to wear a mask, except when they're seated at their table with their group and they're eating. How do you yeah. get, so is that the assumption they're gonna have their mask in between their munching? So, and that, that's actually, so I guess I would add this, this clause and I, as, as a refinement on that is that this ordinance shall not strictly apply to the extent it would frustrate the primary purpose of the business. So that way it's, okay. it's you know, it's, it's carving out this limited exception to the extent that it frustrates the primary purpose. So like in the restaurant example, you wear the mask while you're walking in, but you know, it's not to be interpreted as preventing you from drinking or eating. Um, and same thing with the haircut, hair salon. So, you know, if you're getting your beard trimmed, you're gonna have to lift up the mask, but if you're just getting the, the neck hair removed, um, you know, you can keep the mask on. Right, but the, and the assumption would be that if indeed, if 
doesn't inter- impact the employee with their duties, they would keep theirs on even though the right. eater might not. Okay, thank you. That makes sense to me. Um, Jack, did you have something else you wanted to add? No, I'm happy with where we're going. Okay, uh, Connor. Yeah, no, I think just to follow up on that, like how would we see like a coffee shop playing out, right? You go in, you buy a coffee, maybe you have a couple sips on the way out or something. How would that fall into something like this? I, uh, well, at least I, I would think, you know, uh, the way the coffee shops are being formulated right now, they're not on-premises consumption, they're takeout. So you're not, that's not the primary purpose to sit there and drink coffee. Um, but presumably if they did, yeah, you would be able to, 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 to sip the coffee. But if you're just walking out and can't wait to get that caffeine, I, I don't think you're frustrating the it wouldn't frustrate the primary purpose for you to say to either the shop owner or who was ever enforcing this to say, just wait and go out. And I wouldn't interpret this exemption exception to apply to that situation. I would imagine as well that if you're actually in the establishment um, getting coffee, then there may be that would be at such a time that other people are able to dine. And so you're effectively you know, dining <laughs> in a certain sense at that point. Um, I think we also have to understand that, you know, this is a whole new territory of regulation and, and practice for everybody. And we're probably not gonna cover every detail and explicit, you know, explicitly. Uh, and some of this we may have to learn as we go, but the message is wear your masks in a public place in, in an establishment, I think. Before we get too into the weeds, that's where we were, that's where you all wanted to head and where we probably want to go. Yeah. So, um, Lauren. Um, just wanted to, to circle back. Did we in the, in Jack's amendment, um, fix the issue that Dan Groberg had raised about face shields? I was just trying to remember, had we removed that? And then did we want to add, did we add that language to the exception language or did we want to? Now that we're in the exceptions as an alternative, people could wear um, with you know health or other challenges. We had talked about maybe doing that, so I wanted to just re-raise that. I think we removed it from the previous section, but we did not add it into the exceptions. Is that correct, Cameron? Mm-hmm. Um, Donna, go ahead. Uh, I understand a bit of your concern. I would rather not add face shields to the exceptions because I feel it's a heavier burden to find them for one thing and that people may have still have the same health issues. Uh, but that may be Well, hard. I think I, I just want to put that out there that if, if you say something like if anyone has a medical condition that's complicated by a facial covering like a cloth mask, a face shield is an appropriate alternative if they feel safe. Like, so it makes mm-hmm. that okay. if they have that they know that it's an alternative that they can wear inside that building. Okay, if, an alternative versus a requirement, you mean? Right, okay. right. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. So it's feeling like we may be at the point of another um, motion to uh, amend this language, um, either with Dan's or with Jack's um, language, um, and then possibly also plus adding in the face mask Alternative um, thoughts on that? Anyone want to make a motion? Um, could I? Can you take a comment? Um, yeah, sure. sure. Go for it, Stephen. Okay. I just I, I I'm trying to look at this from a point of view of both a customer and a merchant, and it's unclear who's responsible for enforcing this and what the penalties are. You know, if it's going to be so complex that the merchants are going to be nervous whether they need a lawyer to interpret it and whether or not they're on the hook for a fine for not understanding it versus the, or is the, or is there even a penalty in this at all? But I, I'm just, the, the concern is that this is uh, possibly more for show than anything else. And that it, it isn't really workable at, at, at the current way we're proceeding to do it. And I'll just, again, ask you to table it until you can really figure out whether, you know, maybe you want to require M95 masks because they're effective, you know? I 
enough. Thank you. Well, you raise a, a good point about consequences. Um, uh, with uh, we've not actually, I think this is the first um, emergency order I've ever been a part of issuing. Um, so I'm not, I don't know what's normal necessarily for consequences. Any comment about that, either Bill? Um, or we did speak with Chief Fakus about this. You know, this is operating the same way as the as all of the state's orders, which is that the expectation is that there will be voluntary compliance, and that has generally been the case here in Vermont. Um, you know, certainly someone can volunteer can violate this order. We'd have to look exactly what happened to them. But there's a secondary, if, if someone's in, a, in one of these establishments and are being asked to leave because they're in violation, they're also trespassing. Uh, and that, I think the police are more interested in um, eliminating the problem as it exists at the time rather than necessarily finding people that, you know, the idea is if someone's not being doing something healthy, get them out of the situation. Um, so I, I, you know, Chief isn't on the call, but I, I would be happy to check in with him again. But that was what my understanding, Cameron, am I right about that? Um, my understanding is the same, um, is that this is a voluntary compliance, but it would be the same as like an uh, ordinance violation. It's a, a civil ticket, if I understand it correctly, unless you, but that's not something you'd be actively policing from what we've been told. It is just a voluntary compliance, and if a business asks you to leave and you do not leave, then it is a trespass. Um, so coming back to um, the idea about, or the paragraph on exceptions, is there a motion regarding um, exceptions? I'll, I'll make a motion that we adopt the language that, that I proposed, um, as well as the uh, face shield alternative language and the exceptions. Does anybody I'll need that language? It. Okay, so we've got a couple seconds. Um, do we so, need that language read again, or do you feel clear? I would love to read it out loud, just to make sure everyone is uh, on the same page with what I wrote down. <laughs> I want to make sure I captured everything. So I wrote at the end of the paragraph on exceptions, if anyone has a medical condition that is complicated by facial coverings, like a cloth mask, a face shield is an appropriate alternative. And then in a new paragraph, this ordinance shall not strictly apply to the extent that it frustrates the primary purpose of the business. Jack. Uh, Mayor, I, I noticed that someone else had her hand up. Anne, I don't remember oh. your last name. But oh, before... Anne Charles. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. Ann Charles, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for identifying that. Um, I would just suggest, in terms of enforcement, that the perfect is the enemy of the good. I mean, here we are in the midst of, you know, a health crisis, as we all know, and people are running around in grocery stores without masks. Um, tribalism is arising, people are getting mad at people not wearing masks. And so I think any measure that you, any ordinance like the one you're talking about um, would be a deterrent and would help. I mean, it just seems like a no brainer. It would help merchants, it would help customers, it would diminish um, friction in the community. And, you know, I would think, you know, you're the experts, but if somebody, you know, doesn't adhere to a mask ordinance and someone calls the police, then, you know, they would be fined or whatever. I mean, I don't, um, one of my conversants on this issue said a fine penalizes the poor and so forth. But I think to focus on um, enforcement gets us off the, I mean, it's voluntary and in, certain circumstances it may need to be enforced, but I think passing it, and I would like to underscore what Lauren was saying, I think it needs to be kind of expeditious because here people are running around in supermarkets and have for the last couple of weeks. And, you know, from my anecdotal observation, mask use has increased, but there are several people who, you know, we know who refuse to wear a mask. So I think it would diminish friction and, 
if we got caught up in concerns, if we, if you become deterred by concerns about enforcement, that would slow it down. And I think, you know, expedition action might be the best course here. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, I think there is a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Anyone from the public? Okay. Um, all right, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, all right, so uh, we've got some, lots of refinements to this document. Anything further that people see that they would like to amend? Uh, Bill, did you have something? No, sorry, okay. I, thought, I, thought we were, I, I thought you just passed it, so I'm not paying oh, attention. I, I, I sorry. I, no, it's okay. My understanding is that we've amended, amended the proposal, but we haven't actually passed it yet. You're right. Okay. Um, and the, uh, Dan, go ahead. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to, to put that on the table for discussion by making a motion that we adopt the ordinance as amended um, under our emergency powers as outlined within the ordinance. I'll second. Okay, any further discussion on this? Um, Go ahead, I'll, I'll offer, you, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of, and I've heard from some constituents as well, uh, concerns on both, both sides. I, I'm comfortable with this ordinance because I think it's narrowly drawn. Um, it's focused on the emergency powers that we have and, and the issues. Um, and as Ann mentioned in her comments, this and Dan as well, this takes the issue off of um, people to make these decisions um, and leading to conflict. And it's for a very limited purpose. I don't think we go into this loosely or you know, rashly. I think we have discussed this at past meetings. And I think what we're doing right now you know, is, is exercising some emergency powers so that we don't have disputes about this, that people feel safe going into the places of business um, and that when the need for it is done, the power goes away and the ordinance does as well. And so for those reasons, you know, I do feel comfortable. I think it's a nice balance between civil liberties, public health um, and our general desire to have, you know, these kind of disputes. This is where city government can really be effective in stepping in and, you know, just making a rule. This is the rule we all follow so that people don't have to get into these disputes and squabbles. So that, for those reasons, I'm voting for it and support it. Super. Uh, uh, any other comment from the council or from the public? Okay. Um, all right, so, um, a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Okay. All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for uh, for that. Um, before we uh, take our meeting to Langdon Street, um, I see that um, we are joined tonight by our uh, newly hired uh, police chief, uh, Chief Pete. Uh, so, um, Bill, do you want to do you want to say anything? Uh, I'd yeah. love to like give you an yeah. opportunity to um, to say uh, to introduce yourself. Anyway, but go ahead, Bill. Sure. So we as we had a press conference this morning introducing Brian Pete as our next police chief. He'll begin. He's quarantining now, although I think he's going to walk Langdon Street with us tonight um, and uh, get a sense of how we all operate. Um, and he will begin working with us on June 15, which we're very excited about, along with Tony Fakus. And then uh, when Tony finally says farewell to us on June 30, the Chief, will, Chief Pete will take over for real uh, on, on July 1st. Uh, although I say for real, we do have to wait for you to get through. So, so this is nothing to do with the Chief. Uh, this has to do everything to do with Vermont's certification process, which is archaic. It takes forever, so until he completes all the certification required to come in from another state, he, he won't have full police authority, but will certainly be the chief in charge of the department. Uh, 
Um, so he won't be out issuing tickets or arresting people for a week or two or a month or two uh, until that time comes. But we're delighted to have him. Uh, he, he was most recently the chief in Alamogordo, New Mexico. He's from Chicago, so he says the cold doesn't scare him. And he and his lovely wife, Natalie, and their adorable daughter, Gabriella, age six, have already moved to Montpelier and I think have uh, got a house to buy, right? So I'm gonna let Brian say hi. Um, and uh, most of you city councilors were on the call this morning, but I wanted to also catch up while some members of the public were here. So Brian, put you on the spot. Hey, yes, sir. Uh, I just good evening. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, an extreme privilege. And um, I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to working um, for the citizens of this great city and doing my best to continue on the legacies and the foundations that have already been set by Chief Fakus and to continue our culture of uh, um, inclusivity, uh, transparency and accountability. So thank you all for your trust. Thank you for this amazing, outstanding opportunity. And again, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to being here. Thank you, Chief. You did miss uh, actually a, a longer than expected conversation uh, earlier in the meeting about police and transparency. So I think we may have promised you a couple for a couple of community forums at least. <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> the, I understand, and and I'm ready for it, and ready to get out there and talk to folks, and um, and and and, and do my civic duty and service. Thank you. Thanks Thank for joining you. us tonight. Thank you, sir. I think yeah. I, I will just introduce you to everybody in person. You know, do a photo. Um, okay, so uh, in anticipation of discussion about the possible closure of Langdon Street to traffic partially or temporarily or something like that, uh, next week's meeting, uh, we are going to take this meeting to Langdon Street um, in a socially distanced way for a walk uh, just to get a visual. So, um, where should we meet? Langdon in Maine? Sure. Okay. Got it. What's that? Nope. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, okay. so. If you want to meet me here at City Hall? We can walk over together. It's... Cool. Right. If you want to meet me here at City Hall, we can walk over together. Yes, sir. I'll be there. All right. <laughs> or, or if he comes down State Street, I'm on East State Street. I can wait outside. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I'll be coming down from Betsy's B&B. There you go. All right, we'll see you all in a few. Okay, see you soon. And we will not be taking up any business after that. So but that um, is an open public meeting if anyone wants to attend. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll see you all there soon. You want to adjourn? Yes. No. Uh, not technically. Not until uh, we're done at Lake Street. Okay, we don't adjourn until we get there. Okay, fine. Well, and until that walk is done. Okay. So. Okay, thanks. See you all soon.